Good morning. My name is Maddie Chelstrom. I am the executive oh. director of the sixth annual Nantucket Book Festival. I am delighted to welcome you here this morning. We thank you for being here because it may be obvious to say this, but we would not be here if you were not here. You come out and you support us every year, and believe me, nobody is happier than I am to see you out in the audience this morning. So thank you for coming back every year and supporting Nantucket's Book Festival. It's also very important to us to thank the sponsors who make this festival possible. They make it possible for over 75% of our events to be free and open to our community and to our visitors. So we thank especially Nantucket Island Resorts, Wendy Schmidt, the Nantucket Athenaeum, the Inquirer and Mirror, WCAI, N Magazine, Haft Productions, the Nantucket Historical Association, and the Dreamland Theater. Would you please join me in thanking you? Now, the year-round work of the Book Foundation, including the Book Festival, would not be possible if it were not for the loyalty of festival goers and friends in attending and supporting us. So if you would like to contribute to us and continue the festival and our year-round work, our volunteers have donation forms, or you can go to our website and donate to us there. We truly appreciate anything that you can do to support us. We would also appreciate having your email address, because that is enables us to keep you updated on what we're doing and on any changes that might be happening during the festival. After today's presentation, Alice will, um, Jody, I'm sorry, will be happy to sign books which are for sale downstairs. Now, in order to facilitate events going on in Hendricks Hall as well as the sanctuary this morning, we're asking that if you would like Jody to sign a book for you, you can exit to the right to um, the, the door in the rear by that nautical mirror. If you are not getting a book signed this morning, you, we ask if you would please exit out the side door, and that way we'll keep traffic as uh, coordinated as we possibly can. So at this time, I'd like to ask you to silence your cell phones. And now, I'd like to give you uh, our beloved author and great festival friend, author Alice Hoffman, who is here this morning to introduce Jody. Alice? Thank you, Maddie. I appreciate it. I am very happy to be here this morning to introduce Jody Pico and to join you in celebrating small great things which of all of her wonderful novels I consider to be her best yet. Jodi has the courage to take on issues and ideas that are difficult and thought-provoking and important. She does what no one else does, and you know a Jodi Pico novel as soon as you begin reading it. This powerful novel is about racism and its effects, but it's also about what it means to be human. In my experience as a reader of Jodi's work, and as a friend, she is fearless. She doesn't think about what she should write, but what she must write. She goes to places that other writers wouldn't dare to approach, and she gets it right every time. If you haven't, if you haven't read Small Great Things yet, you should. And if you have read it, then you understand that it's a novel that speaks directly to what's happening in our country today. It's a fantastic read, but it's something more. It's a lesson for us all about a world that is cruel and beautiful and unfair. It's a story about what we are to each other and what we can be. What literature does at its best is to take you inside of a story and make you feel what the characters feel. And in doing so, it makes the world a wider place. And so today, it's a pleasure for me to introduce someone I love as a writer and as a friend, Jody Pico.
Thank you. <laughs> Those of you who are fans of mine probably know that Alice Hoffman is my favorite writer. When I, whenever I'm asked, who should you read, I say Alice. So when I hear stuff like that, I just really want to cry. And um, I'm going to quit right now because it's not going to get any better than that. <laughs> so today at 9 a.m., we're having a nice little chat about racism. Um, I'm going to talk to you about my book, Small Great Things, but in case some of you have not read it, I'm going to introduce the book by letting the main character speak for herself before I talk about why I wrote this book and what hopefully you can learn from it. So I really don't need to tell you very much except that the character whose voice I'm going to be reading is Ruth. Ruth is an African-American labor and delivery nurse with 20 years of experience on a labor and delivery ward in New Haven. This is Ruth. The most beautiful baby I ever saw was born without a face. From the neck down, he was perfect. Ten fingers, ten toes, chubby belly. But where his ears should have been, there was a twist of lips and a single tooth. Instead of a face, there was a swirling eddy of skin. His mother, my patient, had received prenatal care, including an ultrasound. But the baby had been positioned in a way that the facial deformity hadn't been visible. No one was expecting this. Maybe for that very reason, she chose to deliver at our little cottage hospital and not Yale New Haven, which is better equipped for emergencies. She labored for 16 hours before she delivered. The doctor lifted the baby, and there was nothing but silence. Is he all right? The mother asked, panicking. Why isn't he crying? The OB silently met my gaze and turned back to the parents. In soft words, he said their child had profound birth defects that were incompatible with life. On a birth pavilion, death is a more common patient than you would think. When we have anencephalies or fetal deaths, we know the parents will still have to bond with and mourn for that baby. So I cleaned him and swaddled him the way I would any newborn, while the conversation behind me stopped and started like a car choking through the winter. Questions no one ever wants to ask and no one ever wants to answer. The mother was still crying when I settled the baby in the crook of her elbow, his tiny hands windmilled. She wore an expression I've only seen in paintings in museums of a love and a grief so fierce they forged together to create some new raw emotion. I turned to the father. Would you like to hold your son? He looked like he was about to be sick. I, I can't, he bolted from the room. I cornered him in the parents' lounge. Your wife and son need you. That's not my son. That, that thing is not going to be on this earth for very long, which means you better give him all the love you had stored up for his lifetime right now. When we entered the hospital room, his wife was still nuzzling the infant. I took the tiny bundle from her arms and handed the baby to her husband. I've thought about my actions, you know, if I did the right thing, if it was my place. When the father started to cry, the sob shook his body like a hurricane bends a tree. He sank down beside his wife on the hospital bed. They took turns holding their son for 10 hours. That mother, she even tried to let him nurse. I couldn't stop staring because it was the most remarkable thing I'd ever seen. Love has nothing to do with what you're looking at and everything to do with who's looking. When the infant died, it was peaceful. We made casts of the newborn's hand and foot for the parents to keep. I heard the same couple came back a few years later and delivered a healthy daughter. It just goes to show you, Every baby is born beautiful. It's what we project on them that makes them ugly. On Thursdays, my shift goes from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. We usually have two nurses on the birthing pavilion, three if we're swimming in human resources. I note how many of our delivery suites are occupied, three right now, a nice slow start to the day. Marie, the charge nurse, is already in the room where we have our morning meeting when I come inside, but Corinne, the second nurse on shift, is missing. What's it gonna be today, Marie asks. Flat tire, I reply. This guessing game is a routine. What excuse will Corinne use today for being late? Oh, that was last week, I'm going with the flu. She looks up from the regional section of the paper. I saw Edison's name in here today. My son has made the highest honors list for every semester of his high school career, but just like I tell him, that's no reason to boast. There are a lot of bright kids in this town. Still, Marie says, for a boy like Edison to be so successful, well, a boy like Edison. I know what she's saying, even if she's careful not to spell it out. There are not many black kids in the high school, and as far as I know, Edison's the only one on the highest honors list. Comments like this feel like paper cuts, but I've worked with Marie for over 10 years now, so I try to ignore the sting. White people don't mean half the offensive things that come out of their mouths. 
Corinne explodes into the room. Sorry I'm late. That stupid tire I replaced last week has a leak or something. Marie reaches into her pocket and pulls out a dollar, which she flicks across the table at me. All right, she says, floor report. Room two is Jessica Myers. She had a vaginal delivery this morning at 3 a.m. I'll take her, Corinne and I say in unison. Everyone wants the patient who's already delivered. It's the easier job. I had her during active labor, I pointed out. Right, Marie says. Ruth, she's yours. Room three is Thea McVaughn. She's in active labor. I've got her, Corinne says. We only take one active labor patient at a time if we can help it, which means the third patient will be mine. Room five is a recovery. Brittany Bauer was a gestational diabetic. Babies on quarterly blood sugars. Got it, I say. I push away from the table to go find Lucille, the night nurse, who hands me Brittany Bauer's file. Davis, I read. That's the baby? Yeah, I haven't done the bath or the newborn assessment yet. No problem. Is that it? The dad's name is Turk, Lucille says. There's something a little off about him. Like Creeper Dad? Last year, we had a father who was flirting with the nursing student in the room during his wife's delivery. When she wound up having a C-section, instead of standing behind the drape near his wife's head, he strolled across the OR and said to the nursing student, is it hot in here or is it just you? No, 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 no. This guy's just, he's sketchy. I can't put my finger on it. I knock softly. I'm Ruth. I'm going to be your nurse today. I smile down at the baby cradled in Brittany's arms. Oh, isn't he a sweetie? What's his name? I ask, although I already know. It's a means to start a conversation. Brittany doesn't answer. She looks at her husband, a hulking guy who's sitting on the edge of his chair. He's got military short hair and he's bouncing the heel of one boot. I get what Lucille saw in him. Turk Bauer makes me think of a power line that snapped during a storm and lies across the road just waiting for something to brush against it so it can shoot sparks. Brittany, it's almost like she needs his permission to speak. Domestic abuse, I wonder? Davis, she chokes out. His name is Davis. Well, hello, Davis. Would you mind if I take a listen to his heart and lungs? Her arms clamp tighter on the newborn. I can do it right here. You don't have to let go of him. You have to cut a new parent a little bit of slack, especially one who's already been told her baby's blood sugar is too low. So I tuck the thermometer under Davis's armpit and get a normal reading. I press my stethoscope against the baby's back, listening to his lungs. I slide my hand between him and his mother, listening to his heart. It's so faint, I think it's a mistake. I listen again, trying to make sure it wasn't a fluke. Turk stands up, so he's towering over me. Nerves look different on fathers. They get combative sometimes, as if they could bluster away whatever's wrong. I hear a very slight murmur, I say delicately, but it could be nothing. Still, I'll have the pediatrician take a listen. While I'm talking, trying to be as calm as possible, I do another blood sugar. Now this is great news, I say, trying to give the Bowers something positive to hold on to. Davis's sugar is much better. I walk to the sink and run water, fill a plastic bowl, set it on the warmer. Why don't I get him cleaned up and we can try nursing again? I scoop the baby up. I look for facial bruising, hematoma, abnormal shaping of the skull. I check the palmer creases in his tiny hands. I measure the circumference of his head and the length of his squirming body. The whispering behind me has stopped, but instead of feeling more comfortable, it feels ominous. What do they think I'm doing wrong? By the time I flip him back over, Davis's eyes are starting to drift shut. I diaper him, wrap him up in a blanket like a burrito. I can feel the parent's eyes hot on my back. There, I say, handing the infant to Brittany again. Clean as a whistle. Now, let's see if we can get him to nurse. I reach down to help position the baby, but Brittany flinches. Get away from her, Turk Bauer says. I want to talk to your boss. They're the first words he's spoken to me since I've been in this room. I'm pretty sure he doesn't want to tell Marie what a stellar job I've done. I find her filling out a chart. We've got a problem in five, I say. The father wants to see you. What happened? Absolutely nothing, I reply. I told them I heard what sounded like a murmur and that I'd contact the pediatrician and I bathed the baby and did his exam. I must be doing a pretty, pretty awful job of hiding my feelings, though, because Marie looks at me sympathetically. Maybe they're worried about the baby's heart. I'm just a step behind her as we walk in. I understand you wanted to talk to me, Mr. Bauer, Marie says. That nurse, Turk says, I don't want her touching my son again. Heat spreads from the collar of my scrubs. No one likes to be called out in front of their supervisor. I can assure you that Ruth is one of the best nurses we have, Mr. Bauer. If there's a formal complaint, I don't want her or anyone who looks like her touching my son, 
the father interrupts, and he folds his arms across his chest. He's pushed up his sleeves while I was out of the room. Running from wrist to elbow is the tattoo of a Confederate flag. Marie stops talking. For a moment, I honestly don't understand, and then it hits me. They don't have a problem with what I've done, just with who I am. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So, 20 years ago, I wanted to write a book about racism. And I actually started doing it because I was living in the New York area and there was a story about an African-American undercover cop, cop who was shot four times in the back by white colleagues, uh, even though he was wearing what was called the color of the day, which was a wristband that identified the fact that he was an undercover cop. And the whole situation really upset me and I started a book and I failed miserably. I could not seem to write authentic dialogue, authentic characters, authentic situations, and I really questioned myself. I wondered, do I even have the right to write a book about racism? Very clearly, I am white. I have grown up with privilege. Who am I to talk about racism in the United States? And I took the book and put it aside. But over the years, I kept thinking about it and coming back to it. And I would play devil's advocate with myself. I would say, oh, okay, you write all the time in the points of view of people you're not. You've written as school shooters. You've written as Holocaust survivors. You've written as men. You're never going to be any of those things either. So what's the difference? Well, race is different. It's hard to talk about without offending people. And so as a result, we usually just don't talk about it at all. Flash forward to 2012. I read an article in the newspaper that comes from Flint, Michigan. An African-American nurse with 20 years of experience on a labor and delivery ward helps deliver a baby, and in the aftermath, the baby's father calls in her supervisor and says, I don't want this woman or anyone who looks like her to touch my kid. And he pushes up his sleeve to reveal a swastika tattoo. He was a white supremacist. In their infinite wisdom, the hospital put a post-it note in the baby's file that said, no African-American personnel to touch this baby. The African-American nurse and several other colleagues of color banded together. They sued. They wound up getting what I hope is a phenomenal payout. But it made me wonder, what if? What if that nurse had been alone with the baby when something went wrong? What if, as a result of her action, she wound up uh, on trial being defended by a white public defender who, like me, like I imagine many of you, would never consider herself to be a racist? What if I could tell the story from three different points of view? The African-American nurse, the white supremacist father, the white public defender, as they all began to unravel their beliefs about power and privilege and race. Suddenly I realized I was going to be able to finish this book, and here's why. I wasn't writing a book about racism to tell people of color what their lives are like. That's not my story to tell, and to be honest, there are many wonderful authors of color doing that every single day. I was writing a book to the people who look like me. People who can very easily point to a white supremacist and say, that's racist, but they can't point to themselves and say the same thing. This was the hardest book I have ever written in my life. It took twice as long to write. I could still be doing research for it if I wanted to. And I also knew that I couldn't ask all of you to unpack your biases if I hadn't done it myself. So I actually started off by reading everything I could about uh, social and racial justice. Unlike my kids, I am too old to have had those courses in college, so I was starting at ground zero. Then my son-in-law, who wasn't my son-in-law at the time, um, but he said to me, you know, I'm attending a workshop on undoing racism. Would you like to come with me? And I thought, yeah, I mean, how bad could this possibly be? I'm a nice person, right? And I went to this incredible workshop and I left in tears every night. And it was because of the stories that I heard at this workshop that were so arresting to me, like the Asian American woman who was very visibly upset talking about how hard it was to use eyeliner because it was the standard of beauty in America, but it was hard to put on her own features. 
or the African-American woman who stood up and said every day when she walks out the door, she has to put on a metaphorical mask so that when she steps outside, she is the kind of black woman other people can handle. And just once, she would like to walk out that door and not think about it. Then I gathered together a group of women of color who were kind enough to overlook my ignorance about their upbringing and share with me their hopes, their fears, their failures, their successes, and yes, their stories. So there was the young woman from Vassar who had graduated and still carried around her Vassar water bottle on public transportation so that she could put it with the word Vassar facing out on the seat next to her. And as white people walk by, they would know she was safe to sit with. There was the young mom who had the world's cutest baby on her hip and came in to talk to me the day after the shooting of yet another unarmed African-American man by the police. And she was hysterical. And she said, how do I do it? How do I teach my child to not be black when he grows up? There was the mom my age who said to me, how often do you talk about racism with your kids? And I said, oh, you know, I mean, when something happens in the news. And she was shocked. She said, oh, I talk about it every night. It's a matter of life and death. I had lived 50 years of my life not understanding that not talking about race is a privilege in and of itself. Now, there was other research I had to do because not only am I not a person of color, but I am also not a white supremacist. So I actually found two men who have left the white supremacist movement who were willing to talk to me about their experiences. And everything that you read in this book is accurate and happened to one of them. I will also tell you that I cut 70 pages of Turk's narrative. Um, so you can imagine how much more there was to tell. The first guy is a guy named Tim Zoll. Tim grew up in Orange County, California, a very privileged existence uh, with a family of means, became a white supremacist, and one day he was out with his buddies, and they went and beat up a gay man and left him bleeding on the curb, expecting him to die. Years later, Tim got out of the white supremacist movement, and one of the first things he did was write a letter to the head of the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles, because at some point during his illustrious career as a neo-Nazi, he wrote this guy a really mean note, and he wanted to apologize. And the rabbi wrote him back and said, why don't you come work for me? So Tim went to the Simon Wiesenthal Center and spent every day talking about leaving a life of hate. One day he was sitting in the cafeteria and he looked up and his eyes locked with a man who was leading a tour group through the cafeteria. It was the gay man that he had beaten up and left to die. They spent months reconnecting, talking to each other. There were apologies, there was forgiveness. Uh, they consider themselves friends now. They spend holidays at each other's houses and every day they get up together and they talk about their experience to groups. The second man that I spoke with is a guy named Frankie Meek. Frankie ran a very violent skinhead group in Philadelphia. Frankie, like many skinheads, was sent to jail for a time. And when he was in jail, he figured out pretty quickly that he had more in common with the African-American kids than he did with the white kids that were in jail. So for example, they would have Bible study together. They would talk about the girls that they missed on the outside and the food that they missed on the outside. When Frankie got out of jail, one of his first jobs was to go work for a Jewish man. Now, Frankie had been taught his whole life, of course, that Jews will try to cheat you out of all your money. So the night before his contract was due, he wound up being called into the boss's office. He went in, and uh, he was sitting there going, here it comes, I'm going to get stiffed out of all my money. And the boss said to him, Frankie, you have done such an exemplary job, I actually would like to pay you double what I contracted you for. And Frankie began to wonder how many exceptions to the rule do there have to be before you realize perhaps the rules are wrong. So these two guys told me that the face of white supremacy has changed. We no longer have people wearing Doc Martens and suspenders going around in the streets and beating up um, folks. You know, basically too many of them were being thrown in prison for that. So they decided a different approach was, was something they should try. And now they spend most of their time online working individually or in small cells. And they are trying to incite fear and hate through online social media, through postings. They might go into communities and make it look like there are many more of them than there actually are. So they'll go into a temple parking lot, for example, and, during Friday night services. And they'll put uh, the final call from the Nation of Islam underneath all the windshields 
windshield wipers of the car just to freak the community out. That's the kind of stuff that they are doing nowadays. Um, there are, however, still gatherings in places, uh, usually on Hitler's birthday and for Aryan Independence Day in um, the summer. They're in big muddy fields in places like New Hampshire, where I live, um, kind of off the grid. You can go there and you pitch a tent, uh, you can get a tattoo, you can listen to white power bands. You can bring the kids too because there are kitty activities like pin the star on the Jew or a pinata that is an African American man hanging from a noose. You can go target shooting and the targets are President Obama and Martin Luther King Jr. This is happening right now, right now in our country and someone is making those materials for these groups. I learned so much writing this book. I learned that just because you don't talk about racism does not mean that you are not part of the problem. I learned that it's more important to talk about it and make mistakes and learn from them and say, I am so sorry, thank you for teaching me that and moving forward than it is to pretend it doesn't exist. I also learned that racism is not just about prejudice. Racism is also about power. And if you are white in America, you hold all the power. It's that simple. Racism is big and messy and overwhelming and systemic and institutional. But it is perpetuated daily and also unraveled daily in individual acts. And although it's really easy for most white folks to be able to see the headwinds of racism, to know that if you are a person of color in America, things might be a little harder for you, it's really difficult for us to acknowledge the tailwinds of racism, which is the ways that we have it easier because we're born with light skin in this country. And we like to chalk those moments up to luck or hard work. You know, you might say to yourself, for example, well, I worked really hard, I got a great job, and that's why I was able to rent a really fantastic apartment. True, but it also could have been because your landlord didn't really want to rent to someone of color. Now, you may never have known that, but you still benefited by getting the apartment. Or maybe you think, look, I studied all through high school and I got into a great college. This is true. But it also could be because your mom was home when you were three and four years old to read to you and to instill a value of education in you when a person of color might have had a mom who was working two or three jobs and wasn't there to do that. So he was playing catch up in the educational system for the rest of his life. When you begin to think about the American dream that way, it doesn't look quite so dreamy. So why did I write this book? And why did I write fiction? Because I have been where you are, if you look like me and you're sitting in the audience. I have been someone who wants to engage about racism and has no idea how to do it. And fiction is this amazing springboard. Sometimes people who won't have a conversation about race might read something or see a movie about race and be willing to talk about it. You start off very generally by saying, oh, you know, when this happened to Ruth, it made me feel this way. And then you extrapolate into, that reminds me of something that happened on the news. And suddenly you're having a very organic conversation about race with someone who might have been resistant. For me, writing this book is hopefully a tool to get you to join this conversation. Now, if you have read the book, you are probably left thinking, what can I do? How can I make a change in my own life? And if you haven't read the book, you're going to feel that way when you read it. So I am going to give you um, a little private social justice tutorial right now with the caveat that I am not a racial justice educator. So what I'm going to tell you is just what I learned doing this work in the hopes that some of what I learned can actually help you as well. So first of all, I'm going to tell you all the things that you should not do because we constantly, as white people, make mistakes when we talk about racism. So the first thing that you should never do is say, I'm colorblind. Let me tell you why. I know what you mean, we all know what you mean. But when you say I'm colorblind, what you're really saying, what a person of color is hearing is, I do not acknowledge that having skin a different color from light skin has made your life different from mine. You're erasing all of that experience. And that's not really what you wanna say. What you really wanna say is you are color aware and you know that there are differences because of the color of skin in this country. Do not say, I totally get it, I'm a minority too. I'm gay, I'm Jewish, I'm female. 
that's great. Actually, if you are a minority in some other group, you understand what it's like to be an underserved group, and you will feel empathy. But when you come right back to some, especially a person of color who's speaking to you about racism with that, you're robbing that person of color of their narrative, and you don't want to do that. You really want to listen. Don't say, do not ever say, I have black friends. <laughs> if you do, great. But you would not want to be considered representative for an entire group. Neither do people of color. And let me tell you, if you have black friends and you haven't talked to them about racism, you don't really have black friends. Um, don't assume that you need to be present at all conversations about race. White people, someone always wants to hear what we have to say. We always have a seat at a metaphorical table, but there are leaders in communities of color who are doing an awesome job. They just sometimes don't have the pulpit to speak from, which leads to um, the next concept, which is how do you help? Well, don't come in as a savior going, I know how to fix this. It's not your job to fix anything. If you really wanna help communities of color, here's what you should do. Find the leaders of the communities and say, hi, I'm here to help, do you need help? And if they say yes, say, excellent, what can I do for you? Just come in with a little humility. And here's a really big one. Do not say all lives matter. Let me tell you why. There is a reason for the Black Lives Matter movement. We know all lives matter. I mean, come on, that's obvious. But let's take a metaphor here. Let's say you broke your arm and you went to the doctor. And you said, my arm is killing me, can you put a cast on it? And he looked at you and went, eh, all bones matter. That doesn't help you in that moment because this arm is the broken one. That's what we mean when we say black lives matter. It is obvious that all lives matter, but it is also obvious that right now black lives matter a lot less than white ones. And until black lives matter more, all lives cannot matter. And that's why we say that. So, thank you. <laughs> That's very kind, you guys. I'm really just stating the obvious. It's okay. <laughs> so now that you've been paralyzed by the fear of what not to do, let me tell you what you can do if you want to make a difference and take steps yourself towards undoing racism in your lives. The first thing you need to do is understand that there is a difference between equal and equitable. Equal means the same. Equitable means fair. So let's say you were a teacher and you had a blind student in your class. Would you give her the same test that you give everyone else? No, you'd give her a braille test with the same information on it, right? That's the difference between equal and equitable. We need to recognize that people, because of their life experiences, start and wind up in very different places in this country. And because of that, we need to make sure that no matter what field we're in, we are providing many different avenues for success, no matter where you are starting from. That's what being equitable is. Educate yourself. We're gonna do a little test here. I want you to raise your hand if you know who Rosa Parks is. Excellent. Now I want you to raise your hand if you know who Garrett Morgan is. Yes! One person over there. You, you do not have homework, the rest of you do, okay? <laughs> Garrett Morgan is an African-American man who invented something you use every single day of your lives. I want you to look him up, and then I want you to ask yourself, why did my education not cover this? That's an excellent question. It is up to us as white people to learn these things. It is not up to people of color to teach them to us. Make yourself uneasy. So taking a quick look around this room, it's a pretty white space, right? Nantucket is a pretty white space. Get yourself off this island and go somewhere where your face color is not the predominant one. It's gonna make you feel really weird. That's great. That's your leading edge, and it means that you are starting to understand what it might feel like to walk through the world if you were a person of color. Notice your tailwinds. So often when we see something going on that we know is wrong, like for example, Uncle Joe tells a really racist joke at Thanksgiving, our tendency is to pretend we didn't hear it, to sort of back away, but not to confront it head on, because we don't want to make a scene, right? It's time to make a scene. It's time for you to say to Uncle Joe, you know, that's not cool, and tell him why. Now, Uncle Joe may never really get it. Maybe he's 102, and you're not gonna teach that old dog a new trick. But you may be the first person who has confronted him about it. And you just might open his mind. 
It is always worth having that conversation if you can. Talk to the people who look like you. The role of the white ally in racism is not to go and tell people of color what they need to do. The role of the white ally is to talk to the people who look like you, like I'm basically doing right now. That means no matter what sphere of life you live in, you can find a way to bring up conversations about race. Let's say you are the member of a board for a corporation, and you happen to notice at your next board meeting that most of the people talking are a bunch of older white men. Be the person who says, hi, you know, we haven't heard from so-and-so yet, and so-and-so might be, a, you know, an African-American man or an African-American woman of color, uh, an African-American woman. Make sure that you are using that seat you have at the table to let somebody else have one. If you are a mom of a second grader, go into your child's classroom and say, hi, I'm just wondering, what are you teaching this year about African-American history? Is it just about slavery and victimization? Or are we maybe going to learn about some heroes and some inventors? Wouldn't that be great? Even better if you are a white mom and you're doing this, because it means that it's important to you too. Use that space that you have and talk about it. And this is so easy. This is the one everyone can go and do today. Go home and look at your bookshelf. Who do you read? Do you read authors of color in direct proportion to white authors? And if you don't, why not? First of all, the way that we grow is by reading people who look and sound different than we do and think differently than we do. Second of all, if you're not reading authors of color, boy, are you missing out on some great stuff. So get yourself to a bookstore or a library and pick up some books by people like Colson Whitehead, Octavia Butler, um, Nicole Dennis Ben, who's here this weekend, uh, Isabel Wilkerson, uh, um, uh, Jasmine Ward, um, uh, Ellen O, oh, Sandra Cisneros, Nicola Yoon, um, Roxanne Gay, Nedia Kurafor. There's millions of people. <laughs> I mean, go out there and read people of color. Yeah, I want you to read small great things, but then I want you to go out and find people who are living that experience and read what they have to say about it. A really great little mnemonic device that I stole from an activist on Twitter is the word ally. And it's a really good way to kind of keep at the forefront the things that we need to do as white people if we want to make a change in the world. A, always center the impacted. In other words, it's not about you this time. L, listen to the people in the oppression. Listen to those stories. That's what's going to move you so deeply and make you want to make a difference. L, leverage your privilege. When you have that seat at the table, make sure you scoot over and bring someone of color with you. And that leads to Y, yield the microphone. Sometimes as a white person, the very best thing you can do is go, are you all listening? Terrific. And just step back and let someone of color speak. So this is scary and overwhelming. But once you see this, you can't unsee it. And I'm going to leave you with a tiny little bit of hope that I learned about when I was doing my research. That is that the same structures in the brain that allow us to hate people we do not know are the same exact structures in the brain that allow us to feel compassion for people we don't know. So to me, that means that the parts of your brain that fire up if you go and commit a hate crime are exactly the same ones that would fire up if you went home and made a donation to the family of Philando Castile today, even though their family will never meet you. And that tells me that maybe love really is the flip side of hate. So that's all I have to say to you about racism today. <laughs> and, um, we have about five minutes, and I would love to take questions from you if there are any. Just raise your hand. The only thing I would ask, and I always ask this, is please do not give away the ending of any of my books or I'll have to kill you. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, stop. <laughs> you guys, stop! <laughs> Thank you. That's very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's done. I will buy a house on the island. All right. Um, <laughs> does anyone have a question for me? Yeah. 
are these points available online? At the very back of Small Great Things is my author's note, which really explains um, why is this white girl writing this book. And uh, it, they are touched upon there, and they are also on my website. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, because let's think about it. White woman walks up to you and goes, I really want to hear about your life. You're like, mm-hmm. Um, there was a lot of side eye going on at first. And I did it actually by connecting with people. I did not, I did not go hold out a placard on the street saying, hi, are you black? Will you talk to me? I actually tried to find um, friends of mine who knew people who they thought might be willing to talk to me. And it took me, like before I even asked a single question, I sat down and I said, let me tell you why I'm writing this book. And I really wanted that made clear before I began. And um, so I met, there were some people who I had run into actually, I gave a talk at Spelman, and there was a young girl there who has become a writer herself. She has a book coming out in September called Dear Martin. Her name is Nick Stone. It is a phenomenal YA book. You should definitely read it. And it is about being a black teen in America right now. And um, she and I struck up a, a very organic conversation and friendship. And we, she was by far the woman I relied on the most. Like, I would text her daily when I was writing things. And we would have this little... Um, it was like a little disclaimer because she was writing too and we would have stupid white girl questions and stupid black girl questions. And so, like for example, you know, I would, I would write to her about straightening hair. I don't know how to do that, you know. And then she would ask me, how long does a sunburn last? Things that she wouldn't know about, right? And it was great because it was this very safe space where we could say these things. Um, she was one of, of my favorite researcher, research people. There was uh, another woman who um, was... Uh, it was a mother and a daughter, actually, duo. A woman who was a, a, an advisee of my daughter's advisor at college who had graduated. Uh, I, that, she's the young African-American woman with the, the Vassar water bottle. And her mom is a fascinating woman who was a nurse um, and also is an educator and lives in a very white town, very much like Ruth in this book. And had a lot of... When I was reading to her some of like, what my plot was, she was like... And then she started telling me her life, and it was basically her life. It was scary. But she was great. And, um, and her daughter, too, who is of mixed race now. She married a second time. And, you know, so it was people like that who knew someone I knew, usually someone white, and um, was willing to take that first step and say, hey, I have this friend who's doing this project. Will you talk to her? And, you know, those were the women who, who were willing to sit down with me. And what's really nice about it is... I actually, this is the joke, I have made black friends through that, you know, which is really great. Um, I love that these are women whose lives I didn't know about and who um, have taught me so much. I, I, can't, I can't even tell you how important they were to me because not only did they also become my sensitivity readers for this book to make sure that the voice of Ruth was accurate, but I really could not have written the book without their experiences, nor should I have. What prompted me to write my very first book? Um, it was my thesis in college, so I had to do it for a grade. Um, but it never got published, and you should all be really grateful for that. And, um, but after that, I mean, I, I just wanted to write. I loved writing. I did not start writing immediately. I actually had like 10 jobs in a two-year period before I became a writer full-time. And um, I wrote my first book while I was uh, teach. let's see, what, what was I doing? I was teaching eighth grade English. I got a master's in education before that. I was working at a textbook publishing company. I worked to teach creative writing and also at an ad agency. So I had all these jobs. And what I used to do was like do my work and then close the door and write. So I was just a really bad person employee. And I was just, I was writing this book at the same time. And then um, I had gotten an agent the year that I was teaching English and uh, I was pink slipped um, the sixth day of school. They hired six new teachers and they fired us three days later because they didn't have money in the budget for the next year. So I had written this book. Also, I got pregnant. So I had two projects going on at once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, yes. Okay. <laughs> I love talking about this one. Who here has read Ta-Nehisi Coates Between the World and Me? Right? I read that book and I was like, oh my God. 
It's so amazing. I could not stop talking about that book. I recommended it to everyone. I bought copies and I handed them out to people. Like it was an incredible book. And so I talked to my friend, Andrea, um, Nick Stone, and uh, I said, oh my gosh, this book is so great. I need to write this man and I need to tell him how good this book is. Right? And so, you know, everyone's on Twitter now, and I follow Ta-Nehisi Coates, and so I was, um, I was going to write him, and the day I was going to send him a really just lovely tweet, he unleashed this tweet torrent about white people who said they liked the book and how he did not write it for white people. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and, um, you know, and he was like, I love that the critics love it, but that, this is not for them. And so, basically... I, I was talking to Nick and I said, I, I don't understand. Why wouldn't he want to hear from me? And, um, and then she just went, she just was really quiet. And then I went, oh, it's not about me. <laughs> and she's like, uh-huh. <laughs> and, and I was like, right, okay. So it is, I am, I am still a work in progress. We are all works in progress. That's okay as long as you're progressing. I have to wrap up. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>